yeah, I, I, I could go on and on about all of his writing and, and, and how much it matters. I, I, I will avoid doing that. I will uh, begin here by saying thank all of you for joining us today. It's good to see a couple of new and some older faces we haven't seen in a while. It's good to see you, Skofi and Misha. Um, I uh, uh, welcome you today on this lovely Tuesday to the Deleuze and Guattari Quarantine Collective's ongoing reading of Anti-Oedipus. We are in our interminable reading of 4.5. Um, we have uh, fortunately done multiple readings now that is more than two paragraphs in two hours. I'm hoping we continue that rate. That would be lovely. Uh, we are at the bottom of 351. Um, <clears throat> this, let's see, where do we even start? I actually, I'm just going to start literally from the end of the previous paragraph and talk through kind of what we've sort of been leading up to. Uh, and also, uh, I believe Drew found uh, the reference from D.H. Lawrence uh, that I think is very worth uh, bringing up. The task of schizoanalysis from a couple of paragraphs ago, this, the task of schizoanalysis is to reach the investments of unconscious desire of the social field insofar as they are differentiated from the pre-conscious investments of interest and insofar as they are not merely capable of counteracting them, but also of coexisting with them in opposite modes. They then go through a handful of bits here and they bring up, as I was mentioning a bit earlier, Jack, they bring up the pervert, the perversions of them. Uh, the, the, the shifting of how uh, the, the law, the structures of society and the socius are able to be perverted. This play that happens in there it is the job of schizoanalysis to, to reach these investments uh, in a way that is differentiated from the pre-conscious, from uh, those elements, and not just simply on their own, but in a way that can be counteracted. <clears throat> they go through a handful of sort of examples discussing the Oedipal uh, essences. One of the lines from uh, Lawrence that ends two paragraphs ago that I was, I've been seriously two straight years, I've been like, well, ever since I've read this, I didn't even focus on it before two years ago. The gray gentleman mentioned by Loris. The, the sentence ends, uh, uh, as long as sexuality is kept conscious, consciously or not within narcissistic, Oedipal, and castrating coordinates that are enough to ensure the triumph of the most rigorous censors. The gray gentleman mentioned by Lawrence. Um, Lord D.H. Lawrence uh, referred to his censors literally as the gray gentleman. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it is meant to be just an example of literally what they're saying there. So I've, I've been wondering about that for two years. Thank you so much for finding that reference for me. I can't tell you how much that settled in a little corner of my brain. Um, the reason he brings up Lawrence is Lawrence had uh, sex in a lot of things that he wrote. And not just like sex as in fucking or whatever it is. Has a handful of really extraordinary lines about what sex can mean. That it is more than... Uh, just simply um, uh, uh, one, you know, penis and vagina, off you go, you've orgasmed. Um, I, I had the line from one of my favorite from D.H. Lawrence um, I mentioned last week, which was uh, sex. Uh, a man and a woman is no more sex than a, uh, than a green, uh, than grass being warmed by the sun the i the act of connection the act of these things coming together the act of something being made from this connection all of these things are what he's driving at that it's 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 not just sex as in fucking it's not just phallic as in penis that there is actually a lot more underneath connection that is happening here the line uh, and then I'll continue i promise i'll get to the reading here in a moment but the line that matters the most as we kind of get into the next few paragraphs as we talk through what psychoanalysis does, what Freud does, and the, the deep critique of Oedipus, that obviously anti-Oedipus, uh, title, uh, is trying to get at the line, a woman is not a model anything. She's not even a distinct and definite personality. A woman is a strange, soft vibration on the air, going forth unknown and unconscious and seeking a vibration of response. Or else, she is a discordant, jarring, painful vibration, going forth and hurting everyone within range. And a man, the same. That's all any of us are. That's all any, any of us are ever. Uh, this, this nature of this thing, this, this odd 
uh, existence that we have. And this is their challenge to psychoanalysis. To end the paragraph, the fundamental difference between psychoanalysis and schizoanalysis is the following. Schizoanalysis attains a non-figurative and non-symbolic unconscious, a pure abstract figural dimension, low schizes or real desire, apprehended below a minimum condition of identity, below these minimum conditions of identity, not at them, not within them, below them. <clears throat> With that, I want to continue forward. Is there any questions or comments on what I've just said leading into this? Because this is kind of, I wanted to go over it. This is like really complicated shit. And I want to make sure that we're generally on the right page and that people listening are like, Okay, cool, because we're about to say a lot of shit around psychoanalysis that is going to be like, it's going to be a lot. Uh, so I'll leave it open for a second if anyone has questions or comments uh, so far on what I've said or what we've read so far in 4.5 or really anywhere in the book up till this point that relates to this, ideally. I don't really want to go back and read earlier stuff. Okay. Yeah, I've got one real quick. There we go. I like your tie back to the, um, I mean, basically what you're talking about there is you're giving us an example of how woman and man function as intensities, right? Uh -huh. So in that sense, you know, we're talking about the molecular as opposed to the molar. And I think that's helpful here, right? Because it's, you know, when they go, like you said, the, the task of schizoanalysis is to look at the indices of desire, right? So what's happening in the molecular and what's happening in the molar and how the two relate, um, as we're discussing. I, I like your example because it gives us an idea of like, there is that um, distribution of, um, of the male or the, the womanly, however you like, um, as an intensity in the molecular. And these kind of things, right, what happens in the molar is we start thinking about their accumulation and the statistical, right? And they go from, um, like, like we said, this unconscious level of um, desire, they go from that to something like the pre-conscious level of interest. So it's the difference between um, the womanly in that molecular sense, right, in terms of the desires uh, more directly versus the womanly um, in a molar sense where we start thinking about what are the interests of woman. And that's where you start relying on things like um, objects aggregating, right? So the phallus, the breast, those take on this, this um, kind of transcendent role as we've talked about in the past. So I, I like what you're doing there. You, it helps us kind of take a real instance of that and look at how it's, um, I'm certain I don't have to spell out how some of these things function in our society, but it definitely leads us toward thinking about that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's getting at, um, and, and they'll be getting deeper into this, it's getting at how Oedipus uh, like bleeds into everything, even as the line, uh, right before this, that it's incredibly difficult to de-Oedipalize even nature, even things, um, uh, even landscapes, even any, whatever it is. Um, we refer to cars as she, trucks as she, but sometimes he, and it's very dependent on very specific coding of trucks, which is silly and stupid. Um, uh, generally that's even done by the people who demand that trans people aren't real because gender is whatever, uh, it, we, everything gets edipalized and we, we do this and we fuck with all this stuff. So like, why, what do we do? What do we do about this? What does psychoanalysis do? And I will continue now with the reading. Yeah. Can I make a comment? Oh, please, please. Yeah. I like the word he uses, uh, this pantheism of, um, you know, uh, flows you know present in the in such sex as this and it's a uh, for me it's kind of an image of the lacanian uh, you know there's a uh, symbolic order that we operate under uh, but those are kind of edipalizations of the real you know flows that are you know operating beneath the symbolic right it's in the unconscious this is a non-symbolic unconscious the pure abstract figuration figural dimensions yeah so it's Correct. It's, it's, it's trying to get underneath that and trying to get to where the flows are going and what flows are doing, where they're being coded, how, what's affecting them beyond just saying like, Oh, daddy, mommy, me, because at that point it's already coded. Like that's, we've got that already. And we kind of know why we need to get deeper. 
Well, that that, that reminds me of the the Rio in in Lacan's uh, you know uh, three orders of three registers. Hmm. And I would even say it's 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 intended to go even deeper than that. Lacan, uh, you know, thought the unconscious operated effectively like a language, or that. Uh, we had a stage of symbols. I think he used the the like a play of symbols in our heads as they're dancing on the stage, and their interaction is is um, much more symbolic than than they're wanting to get here. We're wanting to get deeper. They're, we're wanting to play with flows as they sort of sit. Uh, and I'll get to the this paragraph. I think helps with that. So I'll dive in. <clears throat> what does psychoanalysis do? And first of all. What does Freud do, if not maintain sexuality under the morbid yoke of the little secret, while finding medical means for rendering it public, for making it into an open secret, the analytic Oedipus? We are told, see here, it's quite normal, everybody's like that. But one continues to embrace the same uh, humiliating and degrading concept of sexuality, the same figurative conception as the censors. It is certain that psychoanalysis has not made its pictorial revolution. There is a hypothesis dear to Freud. The libido does not invest the social field as such, except on condition that it be desexualized and sublimated. If he holds so closely to this hypothesis, it is because he wants above all to keep sexuality in the limited framework of Narcissus and Oedipus, the ego and the family. Consequently, Every sexual libidinal investment having a social dimension seems to him to testify to a pathogenic state, a fixation in narcissism, or a regression to Oedipus and to the pre oedipal stages, by means of which homosexuality will be explained as a reinforced drive and paranoia as a means of defense. We have seen, on the contrary, that what the libido invested through its loves and sexuality was the social field itself in its economic, political, historical, racial, and cultural determinations. In delirium, the libido is continually recreating history, continents, kingdoms, races, and cultures. Not that it is advisable to put historical representations in the place of the familial representations of the Freudian unconscious, or even the archetypes of a collective unconscious. It is merely a question of ascertaining that our choices in matters of love are at a crossroads of vibrations, which is to say that they express connections, disjunctions, and conjunctions of flows that cross through a society, entering and leaving it, linking it up with other societies, ancient or contemporary, remote or vanished, dead or yet to be born. Africa's and Orient's always following the underground thread of the libido. Not geohistorical figures or statues, although our apprenticeship is more readily accomplished with these figures, with books, histories, and reproductions than with our mommy. But flows and codes of socius that do not portray anything, that merely designate zones of libidinal intensity on the body without organs, and that are emitted, captured, and intercepted by the being that we are then determined to love, like a point sign, a singular point in the entire network of the intensive body that responds to history, that vibrates with it. Never was Freud more adventurous than in Gradiva. In short, our libidinal investments of the social field, reactionary or revolutionary, are so well hidden, so unconscious, so well masked by the pre-conscious investments that they appear only in our sexual choices of lovers. A love is not reactionary or revolutionary, but it is the index of the reactionary or revolutionary character of the social investments of indicators, this time unconscious, of the libidinal investments of the social field. Every loved or desired being serves as a collective agent of enunciation. And it is certainly not, as Freud believed, the libido that must be desexualized and sublimated in order to invest society in its flows. On the contrary, it is love, desire, and their flows that manifest the directly social character of the non-sublimated libido and its sexual investments. Uh, it's a gigantic paragraph. My favorite is the ones that hit three pages. Um, 
let's go bit by bit. This is, this one might take, um, this is going to be a long one. Uh, opening here. Question is, uh, the I would say more a statement they're making. Psychoanalysis and Freud maintain sexuality under a morbid joke of this little secret uh, while finding medical means for rendering it public. Uh, the little secret being fucking. Well, rendering it public via medical means, uh, via psychoanalysis, via uh, uh, medical determinations of mental health that, oh, uh, uh, homosexuality is, uh, oh God, please don't clip me out of, I'm just stating what they're saying these things did, which is fair because psychoanalysis did the shit. Um, homosexuality, uh, you know, we don't want to talk about two men having sex with each other. That is, that is a no-no. It's terrible. But homosexuality as a medical determination is because ultimately they have not been able to accept X and they've got to do Y. Uh, they use the example here specifically of the paranoia uh, that is created by the reinforced drive that homosexuality is. This is old psychoanalytic determinations of these things. This play that's happening as they're talking about opening here is what they are talking about from the beginning that psychoanalysis does, that it places us in this spot, our subjectivity, it places our sexuality, it places desiring machines and desire itself under the yoke of this gross little thing called sex that is really only about fucking, but we don't want to talk about that. We want to talk about the pain that it creates when it's all broken, like homosexuality or transsexuality or whatever it may be. And the problems that that denigrates. So we have this wall of it's acceptable here because it's medical and it's a problem. But if it wasn't a problem, then you're not allowed to talk about it, which is wonderful. Uh, I mean, that's sarcastically. Um, this this thing that they then do, they turn around and they say to us, uh, hey, oh, see here, it's look, it's quite normal for you to have these weird desires. Everyone's like that. But one continues to embrace the same humiliating and degrading conception of sexuality, this figurative conception as the censors, the way that they view it, the they've, uh, by censoring, they've named the thing, the same as the prohibition on incest, by naming it, by naming the relation, by creating the displaced representative, you've got one of the paralogisms almost instantly. Like this, this, these things start stacking and we end up in this place where we have this figurative conception of sex, where sex is only this thing that is done that way. It's gross. Keep it there unless it's bad, in which case it's medical and we can discuss it coldly and clinically. I think that's how I would describe this beginning part. Is that fair? Anyone? Yeah, I'd like to expand that with, um, this is the three essays on sexuality, um, in its early stage before he goes back and edibilizes it. Um, one of the things he's trying to explain is exactly what you're talking about. I was like, he's trying to explain um, homosexuality. And it's interesting is he's going to argue that it's, um, in some ways he's kind of forward thinking because he's going to argue that like you can't just treat it as an aberration naturally because um, things aren't, because desires aren't defined through their objects per se, he's got a more functional view. Um, and, and that's kind of the, the interesting thing. And you can see that a lot of the time in anti-Oedipus, where especially when they're going to talk about Freud as revolutionary, you know, that functional perspective, um, even though, you know, the, the aims kind of come with perversion. Um, where Freud, I think, kind of slips up and gets the this criticism really becomes tangible is um and, and you can see it in some of the mental health discourses too in a larger sense it's going to make the move to the um the biological and the biodeterministic right and i think that's kind of the the thing that helps contextualize this is um on one hand right the functionality is going to be sort of you've got the ability for the the aberrations to be um not construed under normalization, but actually taken to constitute the normal. But see, this is where the trick is. At that point, I think the thing that we can start to question here then is um, how can you establish such a normality in that manner? 
and I think this is kind of what they're highlighting and they probably simplify that a little bit, where they, they go on to talk about sublimation. I mean, that's mm -hmm. kind of the trick, right? Is like these things are functioning at that molecular level in such a way that they're not um, construed through ends, right? The connective synthesis isn't a question of ends. Um, and in some ways, it's not exactly a question of means, right? It's a question of a flow and two partial objects in a relation of um, emission and breaking, right? And that's the functionality of it. Right. Well, and, and I think it's worth it's worth taking a second. And for those who aren't super familiar with sublimation as a concept, um, uh, and I'm I'm always shaky on my Freud anyway, especially the, the some of the stranger stuff. But uh, sublimation at a basic level is the idea that um, you know, libidinal drives do drive everything, but ultimately we desexualize them to have an actual interest. A, I would work that is the desexualized sublimated libidinal energy that causes me to carve. Um, uh, I, the reason I use that example is there's this old, um, I don't know, like I just, I'm old enough and my grandparents are of the age where I just know I was told at some point the joke of the the guy who whittles and carves because he has so much excess sexual energy and it's how he gets it out and it's how he was taught to be healthy. Like you needed a hobby, uh, idle hands and all of that stuff. And that sublimation is where sex gets turned into something and then invested in the social field. That is the hypothesis dear to Freud that they phrase here. Is that a fair, fair way to explain it, Jack? Yeah, you're, you're spot on, right? It's, there's a tension in the unconscious between um, the id wanting to release, uh, wanting to do something, right? That's what the desire mm -hmm. is. And the ego's got to, in, in Freud, the ego's got to release it to an object because the id doesn't care about objects. Um, what, and, and you're spot on. What happens then is that with the superego, that's going to come in and say, well, however you release it, it's got to be in this kind of socially acceptable way, right? So like to your point, woodworking is a, um, a way of a socially acceptable way of taking the kind of passions and then, you know, the kind of life affirmative stuff of sexuality, desexualizing it and transferring it into something in lieu of what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the move, right? It's like, you know, it's, it's the same thing with kind of homosexuality and why you have the, that critique of the gay liberation movement is. It's going to be a fight over the molar normalization, despite the fact that things aren't connecting in in, um, in anticipation of an interest. Well, no, and it's the I, it's one of the things that is always astonishing to me when we read this stuff because you can say like, oh, a lot of this stuff is esoteric theory, but then when I say sentences and look at our world in America, especially where I say. Um, it's because he wants above all to keep sexuality in the limited framework of narcissus and Oedipus, the ego and the family. Like that's literally American conservatism in a sentence. It's, it's an extraordinary thing, but it is very much what they're talking about. This, this desire that, um, this need for repression where we don't want sex to be this free flowing thing, terrified of that actually. And it needs to be within only this particular framework, anything outside of that, Anything is pathogenic. And that's said the next few sentences give a handful of examples of this. The anything that isn't narcissistic or edipal, um, which in itself feels like a horrifying existence if if this was determinate. Um, anything beyond that is the issue. It's a fixation or regression uh that is is beyond those. And it's how homosexuality is explained as a reinforced drive and paranoia a means of defense against this. This this puts us in a place, again, to go back to the double bind we went over so many times that uh, psychoanalysis puts you in that I think most of chapter two is really goes over like 90 times. Um, this is the challenge you have is you either are going to become Oedipalized or broken and and nothing ultimately you 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 are uh you don't have a personality you are broken and we need to get you forming correctly in this very gross and fucked up way uh in order to be considered a healthy person and that is uh that's this to me just an utterly terrifying and awful thing but that's that's what they're talking about here this 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 move where if it's not sublimated and it's invested directly 
like if it's not any of that, it's obviously pathogenic. Anytime you have a direct investment in the social status, it's pathogenic, you're broken, time to get back in line. Um, and uh, very much we see this mentality treated across the board uh, in modern times. It's a, it's a very strange thing. Um, go ahead. I could expand on that too. Um, the, the easy connection for me on this stuff is the complices, which is, you know, classic psychoanalysis, but you get this in behaviorism too, right? So like the Pygmalion complex where basically, and it's an explanation of subjectivity. Um, it's, 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 it goes straight to the conjunct, even though that implies the other two, just to put it at the conjunct and subjectivity, right? The thing you're, the, the subjectivity that you're taking on is to be kind of construed in the the complex, right? So this is where the pathology kind of comes in. It's like with the Pygmalion complex, right? You're, you keep acting out this desire to fix people. And, and that's kind of the, the social, the, the sublimation of it all too, right? It's like you have these desires for people um, and they get, you know, this complex comes in to relegate them so that you're constantly trying to fix people. This is the kind of thing I think they're talking about. We mentioned it last week with, um, I think Drew found the quote for me, but it was that point about, you know, so I am king, therefore the kingdom is mine. It's that same move where the the, the, the pathology of it, in this case, I'm using the Pygmalion complex, um, that is to um, sort of relegate um, the subjectivity is going on in the molecular, right? So whatever is happening there in terms of the production, the desires, as they're being distributed, right? The complex can come in to say, well, sure, but they all aggregate in this way. So therefore, right, it's going to look this way and this becomes a way of kind of, um, we've said it before this way, right? It kind of becomes a way of limiting desire at the molecular at the molecular level through this kind of um well it tends to look this way this is that point about the normalization they're making right tends to look this way this is how we start getting to that sensor censorship right so in that sense the pygmalion complex can become socially acceptable so long as those other desires um are i mean they use the term defense mechanism here right but mm -hmm. you know are sort of cut off in a, in a manner of speaking um fit into the apparatus or in that sense of what is the dispositive. Yes. Well, and this is where you get into the reason that Reich asked his question. He was very much Freudian, even though he went somewhat anti-psychiatry, he ultimately kind of went back in line with a more traditional view. Um, if sexuality, when it's broken, uh, is what it invests directly. Um, and when you're properly oedipalized and, uh, 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 properly narcissistic, I guess. Um, when, when you're in a healthy state, uh, all of sexuality is, is sublimated. And as sublimated, you've actually turned it into a thing. Uh, you've, you've, you've in that, which can be invested. So the question would be, why then, uh, do you have this desexualization that then is making choices? It's not, it's not, sexually attracted, there's no direct arousal or lack of control. You're, you, you are Oedipalized. So why then are you invested socially in the Nazis? And that breaks a bit because it's, it's not this sort of pure desire, but it seems like it is under fascism. And when you look through it's, it seems like it. So why, why do men want to be repressed? Why, why is it that they're dying for it? And, and Reich had some ideas on this, but their answer I think is very cleanly the next few sentences here where they go, no, no, it's none of this. We have seen on the contrary that what the libido invested through its loves and sexuality was the social field in its economic, political, historical, racial, and cultural determinations. This, the, the whole book has been pointing out how the libido invests directly in these things, how uh, the intensities of them are, are quite real and quite significantly invested. In delirium, the libido is continually recreating history, continents, kingdoms, races, and cultures. These investments uh, that the libido and sexuality is taking um, ultimately through this sort of 
uh, process in delirium, which again, remember is uh, delirium is uh, social, first of all, political, and it is the beginning of sort of the social elements. It is the collective uh, fantasy, you might say, um, is continually recreating history, continents, kingdoms, races, and cultures. The libido is constantly doing that. It's invested in them and then recreating them. Um, and they they want to make clear then, well, 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 wait, we're not doing the thing where we're replacing uh, familial representations with historical representations. That's not necessarily even good. And we're not even going at archetypes of a collective unconscious. This is not any of this. But the point is, it is merely a question of ascertaining that our choices in matters of love are at a crossroads of vibrations. If you go back to the soft vibrations of man and woman and person and everything that I read from D.H. Lawrence, this is their reference, which is to say that they express connections, disjunctions, and conjunctions of flows that cross through a society, entering and leaving it, linking it up with other societies, ancient or contemporary, remote or vanished, dead, or yet to be born. This is, uh, if you want to talk about why people do what they do or why people desire their own repression or whatever the fuck they are, the society they live in, what do they believe? It is a matter of ascertaining that our choices in matters of love, our choices in matters of love, ah, fucking great phrasing, are at a crossroads of vibrations. Um, they express connections, disjunctions, and conjunctions of flows that cross through a society flows, entering and leaving, linking it up with other societies, ancient or contemporary, remote or vanished, dead or yet to be born, Africa's and Orient's always following the underground thread of the libido. Not geohistorical figures or statues, although our apprenticeship is more readily accomplished with these figures, with books, histories, and reproductions than with our mommy. Uh, it's a little jab at how good mommy is at actually teaching us these things. But flows and codes of socius that do not portray anything that merely designate zones of libidinal intensity on the body without organs and that are emitted, captured, intercepted by the being that we are then determined to love like a point sign, a singular point in the entire network of the intensive body that responds to history that vibrates with it. Jesus, long sentences. Um, this is not about figures or statues, uh, although those things help us. Books help us. Histories reproductions help us understand and have those we're, we're able to invest in them more cleanly for sure they help us i help i think would be another way of saying speed along the process in this case um but it isn't those things that we actually are in love with it, but flows codes of associates that portray nothing but only designate zones of libidinal intensity on the bwo this is actually where our investment sits <clears throat> this is actually where we all we happen to desire. This is actually where we're attached. It's where our sex goes, all of our non-human sexes. That would be the phrasing I'd put around that. Um, and I, I quite like it too, because like, I, sometimes I like to compare this to like phenomenology and that. And when I see like something like choice, that's exactly where my mind goes is, you know, why are we making the choices we do? And, there's a whole discourse of responsibility and, and intentionality there and all that. And I think to losing Guadari's point is right. Um, when you're making choices, it's not as though you do them outside of the context, right? Even when you're thinking about something like interests, right? Those interests exist in a social field and have been produced. Um, and this is their point about the, the connections, disjuncts and conjuncts, right? That stuff's um, been fashioned just like you've been fashioned in the subjectivity, right? Any choice made at a conscious level, for at least as I read Deleuze and Guattari, is preceded by this, this, this whole series of productions. So this is to say, right, you, that idea of like, well, I can be free in my mind. No, you can't, right? <laughs> uh, because you've been produced, right? And all these things that you're selecting from, and if you want to rationalize, they themselves have been produced, right? It's not to say it's deterministic. It's to, you know, this doesn't negate choice. This means you have choice under these conditions. And I think that's always critical too, right? Like, because they criticize biodeterminism in psychoanalysis and, and rightfully so. 
in the same way, right? They're not arguing that um, production is that same kind of determinism, right? Just like with the index of love, the kind of choice you would make, right, is tied to one of these indices of reactionary and revolutionary investments, right? It exists in the social field, and it's part of how you're produced. So any choice you make is tied to that under, you know, again, under these conditions, one can have choice. And the way that we sort of have the love happen, what, what the singularity is, it's, it's a really fantastic phrasing they have here. It's worth sort of going through slowly, but the example they give, I think is almost, uh, I mean, it's, it's fucking expert level as far as I'm concerned. Um, these flows and codes don't portray anything. They designate zones uh, that are emitted, captured, and intercepted by the being that we are then determined to love. Like a point sign, a singular point in the entire network of the intensive body that responds to history that vibrates with it. The phrasing there, determined to love, I, they mean very explicitly. Um, we need to remember how we sort of uh, need to do away with the sort of traditional conceptions of choice, even uh, as you start getting more into the uh, ontology that DNG are putting forward here. The love of all of these things, the love of the singularity that is this person, whatever it may be, it's not even necessarily a choice, um, not in the way that we understand it or talk of it, that desiring machines connecting, creating desire, sexual energies being invested in these things. There's a lot of them intersecting and covering up and then lo and behold, boom, right in the middle of all of these, this one little point, singular point in this network that responds to history that vibrates with it. The example they use is uh, uh, never was Freud more adventurous than in Gradiva. Um, there's ramble time for a second. Gradiva is a really great thing to be brought up here because uh, there's a very specific boss relief that Freud owned uh, called uh, 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 delusion and de called uh, Gradiva. Um, it was a sort of just a paint, sort of a bas relief of this woman uh, in like Pompeii. I want to say, uh, I want to say Pompeii, uh, and a, a beautiful woman who uh, uh, he ended up using sort of. Um, um, as he was an, analyzing this other novel, uh, uh, William, Wilhelm Jensen wrote called Gradiva. The story of Gradiva goes, a uh, man, uh, archaeologist, finds this uh, old, old, old uh, bas relief of this woman and uh, falls in love with her, uh, hangs it and just is like, this is the most amazing woman I've ever seen. He, it turns out, though, that he um, actually happened to know a younger woman who looked sort of like that. <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to read a little bit from uh, Wikipedia. An isolated, unworldly individual, Hand Henold, is repressed memory of a girl, Doi Berteng, with whom he has grown up with and to whom he had been affectionately attached, but is unconsciously reminded of her by a bas relief depicting a young, lovely woman with a distinctive gait. He calls her Gradiva, which means the woman who steps along. After a dream about Gradiva and the destruction of Pompeii, Han Henold leaves for Pompeii, where he meets a young woman, very much alive whom he takes for Gradiva. In the course of the meetings, he organizes his mania, stalking, interpreting signs. Gradiva appears at noon, the ghost hour, and starts, you know, assigning sort of meanings to these things. Um, uh, and Gradiva seeks to cure him by gradually revealing her identity to him. The woman is, of course, Hanold's childhood sweetheart, Zoe. And fortunately, his Gradiva is as shrewd as she is beautiful. Zoe, the source of this malaise, also becomes the agent of his resolution. Recognizing Hanold's delusion for what they are, she restores him to sanity, disentangling his fantasies from reality. It is only Zoe who can tell him that his archaeological interest is sublimated desire for her. Um, never was Freud more adventurous than in this. The play that's being made by Freud here is actually pretty unusual for him, at least in my understanding of it. Um, uh, Freud is very clearly talking about how this guy is attracted to, uh, this person. It's not just simply that it's purely Zoe and he's seeing her Zoe. 
but that she has all of these little contingent little lines poking at her. She happens to be in Pompeii when she goes. I think she speaks uh, in Latin and then asks him to speak in German. And he takes this because it is Zoe, but he takes this as the sign that this is the woman from his dreams because this she spoke in German in his dreams. Like he speaks. Um, all of these things he's taking as signs of proof and they kind of all intersect through this singular point. Um, that moment, um, he, uh, what he's into and all of the things he's in love with about her, it becomes clear where they're all from. And she sort of helps utilize them to make him healthier, to make him think of the world correctly or sort of break these deep delusions. And it's a really interesting take on the entire thing, honestly. Um, but that's what they're talking about here to go back. Sorry for the ramble. Um, it's worth reading. Um, uh, thank you, Drew, for posting it up. Um, it's a really interesting read on its own. But for Freud, it's unusual because it doesn't talk back to any of the sort of other stuff we're hitting here. Very specifically, it's about how he is in love with this collection of intensities in this woman. Um, and uh, the history of it, the everything that he connects with her, he finds reasons. He almost self-justifies every single thing through these intensities. The words are meaningless. The, the facts are meaningless. He is in love, almost destined to be with her. And that's the point they're making here, that um, we are determined to love like a point sign, a singular point in the entire network of the intensive body that responds to history, that vibrates with it. In short, our libidinal investments of the social field, reactionary or revolutionary, are so well hidden, so unconscious, so well masked by the pre-conscious investments that they appear only in our sexual choices of lovers. A love is not reactionary or revolutionary, but it is the index of the reactionary or revolutionary character of the social investments of indicators, this time <laughs> unconscious of the libidinal investments of the social field. What we love, what we are drawn to, that which we become fixated on, whatever love, them, the, the thing itself, the love itself is not reactionary or revolutionary. But it is an index. It is an indexical. Remember, we're, we've been talking the last couple of paragraphs. We can't see someone's flows or they're unconscious. We will never be able to. That's silly. But we can use them as indices. This is an indice. This is an indicator of the reactionary or revolutionary character of social investments of the indicators, this time unconscious of libidinal investments of the social field. Every loved or desired being serves as a collective agent of enunciation. Everything you love, everything you desire, every organism being anything serves as a collective agent of this enunciation. Through these indicators, we're able to actually start to understand the libidinal investments that are actually happening in this social field. Um, they end by saying it is not, as Freud believed, the libido that must be desexualized and sublimated in order to invest society in its flows. On the contrary, it is love, desire, and their flows that manifest the directly social character of the non-sublimated libido and its sexual investments. Love, desire, and the flows of sex, the connections, the flows that manifest the directly social character of the libido and its sexual investments. It is an inversion of the traditional Freudian view. It's a really uh, beautiful sentiment, I think, um, but again, pointing towards when we're talking about really wanting to, in the positive task, be able to understand and, and, and grasp where a person is actually uh, unconsciously invested, not just pre-consciously, we need to get beyond that. We have indices and everything we love is an indice of where the investments are sitting. It's not that love. It is no love itself is revolutionary. No love itself is reactionary. They're just indices, but it's a beautiful sentiment in uh, being able to sort of understand, uh, again, um, perhaps where the fascist within lies, where we actually sit on the sort of scale of things, what we're actually desiring and what we actually love, where, where, our, where our investments might be. It's a really great way to look at it. Sorry for the long ramble. Please, I open it up um, again.
And yeah, Drew, for sure, Zoe is being used in that text as a, she is an analyst and an analyst, uh, and, and he's, and handled is the analyst and, um, very much in that and the process. Um, uh, and I think one of the reasons that they say Freud was never more adventurous than in Grimdiva is the method of doing it. She wasn't like trying to push him into an archetype. If you go actually read, and again, it's worth it. I think she's not at any point going excellent. Well, that's your mother, like telling him what his things are. Instead, she actually takes his delusions and works against them almost directly, uh, almost eminently, actually, in some places where uh, she starts counteracting what he seems to believe. Some really cool, interesting things in there that I think are actually pretty applicable and inspirational towards a general schizoanalytic theory. And I, I like it, too, because it... I mean, how they're understanding love, I think, is really important because it's similar to how do they understand delirium, right? So you don't have, you know, we've talked about the polarities, but I think the thing is like how they kind of mix together, right? And I think, you know, we see that with um, the schizophrenic and the paranoiac, that, you know, the way they're interacting and the way those kind of things, those energies sort of um, collide, if you like that's part of the productive thing, right? That mixture of them. Um, and that's part of the delirium, right? Between the, I mean, it is the, truly the between of the molecular and the molar in that sense, right? Um, I like that they're expanding that into love because I think, I, I one, I like that it's not a, a, um, a purity because I think that would be, um, it's an easy way to cheat, right? Is what we just need to love something. Their point is that finding those loves because they're an index, right? That index will include the reactionary and the revolutionary, just like the delirium includes the schizophrenic and the paranoiac, right? And that's the critical thing, right? When somebody, I mean, I think of that Murnau film, um, Phantom, right? But when somebody's, in this sense, right, easiest, one of the easiest ways to find um, the index of love is to look at what, and in this case, who somebody loves, right? You can start, um, I mean, collecting, I guess, collecting what these investments are, you know. How is the reactionary expressed in this? How is the revolutionary expressed? Um, what are the productions that are being expressed here? Because I think, and I think they state it really nicely at the end, right? This isn't what's repressed. This is what actually does the process of production um, at, at, at that social level, right? I mean, it's it's reciprocal, right? So, you know, it's, it, it goes both ways in a manner of speaking, but right. Cause the social field's there and this is invested from the social field, but it's also producing the social field as it goes, right? They're co-productive. And I, I quite like that. They're, they're so consistent there. Um, and I think they're right. This probably is what is generating what people are doing and what the social is doing as opposed to being purely what the social wants to sublimate. Well, and name, what the social wants to name, which is the other part of this that I think is important. And to go back to Gradiva, uh, and, I mean, it's, it's possible my memory is bad, but she, there's no naming of any specific pathology or that he is this or he wants that. He, he wants this, this far off thing of her, Gradiva, he wants her. Uh, but his image of her, but she never even names that. I don't think it's, it is much more about getting where he is, his, basically his libidinal desires have attached in various points and, and sort of undoing that. Because if we talk about all of these things overlapping, all of these intensities in this singular point in the entire network of the intensive history that we're, you know, intensive history of things that vibrates with sex uh, with your sex and your attraction, we actually head in a direction where we're not naming things and we're starting to be able to understand uh, how we escape a little bit more the, the, the jail of representation where everything needs to be named. Everything is a thing. And therefore, as we name it, we then define it. We create edges by creating edges. We also collapse and crush the desiring machines that are within inside. This frees it. This makes it an additive 
thing almost that I'm attracted to this because of all of these expanding desires and and things that are 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 sort of growing out from my mass of an organism like all of the investments I have are attached it happens to be in the singularity well let's find where those are what are you investing and let's start taking that apart and undoing that it it it, it shifts the direction instead of trying to say oh you are a homosexual it's oh you you love this person because of x y and z it doesn't you are a thing is not even something you can even say <coughs> inside of this framework <coughs> yeah right because when you in this case we're talking about people right so loving a person is going to express those molar and molecular investments right those pre-conscious interests and those unconscious desires and that's the interesting thing right like I think of like the petite bourgeois thing at this time, right? That's one way of trying to get at the investments of a pre-conscious, right? And you start thinking about the interest playing into a, um, a love here. But the, I think part of the move here, right? Because I think you're right, Brooks. This is a way of working through these kind of things, working through the interests. And in that way, well, working through the interests and the desires. And in that way, right, we're seeing them as constructive and productive. Um, as opposed to being things within the person. Because I think that's one thing, too, is like, you know, the classic move in, in, in a lot of psychology and, and certainly in behavioralism and psych, um, psychoanalysis is, right, you look for a lover um, that uh, expresses your parent. It's that one thing we all hate, right? And it, sometimes it does become the dirty little seeker, right? It's like, you know, the, the man is marrying his mother and this woman, right? That's the kind of thing where there's a sublimation going on there. So as to say, he's got these desires for his mother and he's passed them on to the um, the wife so as to make them socially acceptable. There's your easy um, sublimative move, right? Did losing Glottery's point is like in that instance. No, not necessarily, right? I mean, there could be a repression going on there um, through Oedipus. But at one and the same time, right, those social interests that are being expressed there, um, that, that is what produces the motherly as opposed to taking it for a regression. Likewise, at the molecular level, what any of those partial objects may be producing in that index, right, that's happening too, right? So you get this mixture of those investments as opposed to um, something as easy as saying, well, it's just a sublimation, right? He's just trying to live out the taboo. <laughs> Please, if anyone has uh, questions, comments, uh, you may speak, or we have uh, the anti Oedipus chat. Uh, if you scroll up a little bit, you should be able to see it under reading groups. Uh, if anyone has a question or comment, because uh, we're about to finish this, and I kind of do want to move directly into the next bit, because there's a big play uh, that's happening here as we start sort of moving forward and I want to make sure we get to it at some point this, this year, I think. Um, um, but it, the last sentence here, um, it is not as Freud believed the libido that must be desexualized and sublimated in order to invest society as flows. On the contrary, love, desire, and flows that manifest their directly social character on the non sublimated libido and its sexual investments. It's, um, this is the point of this entire paragraph. It's flipping the Freudian um, idea of uh, desexualized, uh, sublimated desire is what is invested in saying, no, it's actually um, those flows of desire that manifest directly the social character of the non-sublimated libido. It's, a, it's the point. We're about to get into more of the psychoanalytic theses real fast here. I'll let Ash, Ash is uh, going for it. We'll give them a moment. Lost in thought. Fair enough. We will move directly through to the next six pages. <laughs> Two pages. Here we go. It's a long one. And I think this is going to be the other paragraph for the day. So we will take our time through this one. There's no I think, way to do this one quickly, to be honest. For those looking for a thesis topic on psychoanalysis, one should not suggest vast considerations on analytic epistemology, but 
modest and rigorous topics, such as the theory of maids or domestic servants in Freud's thought. There are some real indices in such areas, on the subject of maids, who are present everywhere in the cases studied by Freud, there occurs an exemplary hesitation in Freudian thought, a hesitation too quickly resolved in favor of what was to become a dogma of psychoanalysis. Philippe Girard, in unpublished remarks that seem to us to have a wide application, situates the problem at several levels. In the first place, Freud discovers his own <clears throat> Freud discovers his own Oedipus in a complex social context that brings into play the older half-brother from the rich side of the family and the thievish maid as the poor woman. Secondly, the familial romance and fantasy activity in general, <clears throat> the fantasy activity in general will be presented by Freud as a veritable drift of the social field, where one substitutes persons of a higher or lower rank for the parents, the son of a princess kidnapped by gypsies, or the son of a poor man taken in by bourgeois. Oedipus was already doing this when he claimed a bir low birth of servant parents. Thirdly, the rat man not only installs his neurosis in a social field determined from one end to the other as military, he not only makes it revolve around a form of torture originating in the Orient, but also in this very field, he causes his neurosis to oscillate between two poles constituted by the rich woman and the poor woman under the effect of a strange unconscious communication with the unconscious of the father. Lacan was the first to emphasize these themes, which were enough to challenge the whole of Oedipus. And he shows the existence of a social complex where the subject <clears throat> the subject at times attempts to assume his own role, but at the price of a splitting of the sexual object into a rich woman and a poor woman, and at other times ensures the unity of the object, but this time at the price of a splitting of his own social function at the other extremity of the chain. Fourthly, the wolfman demonstrates a marked taste for the poor woman, the peasant girl on all fours washing some clothes, or the servant grubbing the floors. Uh, Philip Sherrard, you know, he's just a shoe salesman. Something like that. Um, one moment. Uh, my PDF is all broken here, so give me a second while I grab my copy. Actually, I'm going to get some water. Is this that's the end of the paragraph, correct? Correct. All right, good. Uh, if someone wants to dive in, uh, Jack, if you want to jump in and start, um, I'm going to get some water, and I'll be back in a moment. If you can't, if you can't hear, I'm having a hell of a time. <laughs> I've been there, man. Uh, I mean, let's let's start here. So, you guys um, are in the chat. Is there anything in here that sticks out to you that you want to start with? Obviously, they give us a list of four things to go through, but is there anything you guys would want to start with? Oh, Ash is typing. Yeah, so, so while you're typing, Ash, keep going. So, right, the, the point is we're trying to understand these ind indices, right? These are some real indices in such areas, they write. And the other point is, so we just got done with the criticism of psychoanalysis, but it doesn't inherently do those things. That is to say, it's not always the case, nor must it be the case. That is to say, on the contrary, right, that there are some things like the maid and the domestic servant that function um, with these the indices, right, that we can see these indices um, happening with, without risking the Jungian um, move of, of going to the archetype any more than presupposing a sublimation. Just like I said earlier, right, the maid doesn't have to be the mother. Right, or or to that point, right, this ritual and poor woman, we can start to see how there's a bourgeois and a, you know, a kind of proletarian class interest there. Or that's one thing that 
starts to surface there. That might not be all that's going on. So they go on to say, right, like Freud and, and eventually Lacan um, can show us these things, right? And this seems to me that they're going to focus primarily on Philip Girard, um, who apparently is more than just a traveling shoe salesman um, in his unpublished remarks, right? That he seems to be finding um, what Deleuze and Guattari are talking about, in fact, explicating it. So we'll try and go through these four things, right? Uh, in the first place, Freud discovers so-called his own Oedipus in a complex social context that brings into play the older half-brother from the rich side of the family and the thievish maid as the poor woman. So, right, we can see that there's, and this is the theme, right, is there's a splitting. As much as that's Kleinian, they'll go on to say there's a Lacanian piece to that too. But in that sense, right, rich side of the family, and then the thievish maid is the poor woman. So we've got two things established there. The familial romance and fantasy activity in general will be presented by Freud as a veritable drift of the social field, where one substitutes persons of a higher or lower rank for the parents. So find, just following that, right? So there's, um, there's these two things constructed, right? Uh, the kind of the bougie woman and the thievishly poor woman, or maid, as they say. Um, this is going to go into the social field where the person, in this case, it appears to be Freud, um, substitutes both of those for the parents. So, right, this is kind of where, you know, we talked about the socius and where capital comes in, and then there's the familial simulation, right? Because in capital, as socius, you don't have, um, the, the way the kinship is going to work is it's going to work through money, basically, right? We're tracking how money moves, both vertically, that is to say, in declension, and horizontally as it moves in the political and the economic. So in this case, how that moves is then simulated into the familial, because the familial relies on the social, rather than the social being construed through the familial. So in this case, right, you know, again, that kind of interest level of there's that the wealth and then there's the poverty. This speaks to us to some social investments and certainly some some interests, I would say immediately. But it also speaks to how it's going to simulate the familial. Because by talking about the bougie and the proletariat in that sense, right, we're already presupposing finance. You guys with me so far? I'm going to take that as a yes. But this is where the mixture comes into play, I think. Oh, with all the reference to class, was this an attempt to talk about class through Freud without Marx? Not necessarily. I'm walking class in this more explicitly, but Deleuze and Watery will say, right, interests, and one of those interests can be class. So I'm, I'm focusing on class here. Um, but that's not all that's going on. And so much so that, right, this is where the mixing comes into play where we see the indets in that mixture. So they go on to qualify the higher or lower rank for the parents. And in parentheses, they write out, the son of a princess kidnapped by gypsies, or the son of a poor man taken in by bourgeois. Right, so one thing that happens, there's another splitting happens, and now there's these new social groups being connected. On the other hand, right, we're talking about this drift in the social field. So there's this movement in the ter territory, there's this movement with the flows uh, and certainly the codes involved. All okay, right, I've so. returned. So now I get to repeat everything Jack said because I wasn't here to listen and I don't know what was said. Excellent. We just talked about Twin Peaks the whole time, man. I hate to bring this to you. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it, is, it is partly <laughs> applicable here, more than a little. Um, you could do it. <laughs> oh, you could do it very easily. Um, where where did you actually leave off, though? I just went through the first two theses from Philip Girard, um, the one-armed man, and we were just moving into. So they just they call out Oedipus, and then they they move into the third um, note from Girard, 
The the rat man. Yes. The obsessional, uh, the neurotic, right? Isn't that the one? The, um, God damn it! Uh, what was his story? Yeah. Oh, I I always forget it because I only know it from that Lacan paper. Same here. <laughs> um. Right. Yeah. Um. Yeah. He had generalized obsessional thoughts, and he was neurotic. And you can actually just take it straight from this that. The nature of a lot of what he was doing, very specifically what he talked about, um, even when Freud, if I remember right, did like the the general drills of, of free association and stream of consciousness conversations, and the guy would just go, and it would always be about this sort of, my father is going to be killed, and that he would be the one doing it, um, but he could he's the one who could stop it from happening. But it was always like these strange otherworldly ways that he would go about it. Uh, it never made sense. It wasn't like a thing, but um, it, it ended up being focused, I think, around um, w w women wise. God damn it. Who were they? Because I know the wolf man. We went over the wolf man at length, but what were the women in his life? I'm going to, I'm actually going to Google this. Sorry. I'm going to do this for a second. While you're doing that, one thing we can kind of walk in is we know that there's going to be this point about rich woman, poor woman. Like, like, like you, it's just been too long. <laughs> I remember the rats were part of the torture, though, and it was this whole, like, I mean, this is part of the fantasy of it, is that, you know, as much as there's desire, there's also fear. Right? These are part of the intensities and the subjectivities. And back in this sense, right, not only does the rat man install his neurosis in the social field, so that is to say, right, the neurosis is being produced into the social field. There's an investment happening here. Um, he not only makes it revolve around a form of torture originating the Orient, but also in this very field, he causes his neurosis to oscillate between two poles, constituted by the rich woman and the poor woman, under the effect of a strange unconscious communication with the unconscious of the father. So, right, this investment is moving between the two poles. Um, right, and this is to keep in mind too, right, what we're implying here is that there's, there's, uh, the, there are these molar investments and there are these molecular investments. Right, at the same time, there are these reactionary and revolutionary investments. And we're looking at how that's to use the technical term cathetized, but more, you know, more immediately how, how these investments are being made as much as how they're, as what they're doing. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the torture methods he talks about and they, and they make the comment here that it's very specifically sort of this deep investment in uh, uh, tortures out of uh, China that he had read about. And it's, it's what he described. They were, uh, very much stuff that you see in like uh, American Psycho. It's all, all I could think of. It's the same scene as uh, strapping a rat to a, uh, his his ass and and making it hungry so that way it would eat and kill him. Go out, go into him through his anus. That's why he's called the Rat Man. It's like having a rat bur burrowing and murdering him and torturing him by eating his ass, uh, which is <laughs> that's a thing. Um, but it's it's again this this attachment to these social situations if, if you haven't ever read american psycho that's one of the ways he murders um specifically actually so um sorry spoilers you have to read it though it's not in the movies um is that yeah. an eminem song it is it is it is, <laughs> not, it is it is it is it's a rap from that kid eminem um <laughs> no it's 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 that's why they call him the rat man the the push towards um uh rich woman poor woman um it plays with how his, his dad was seen, his dad died and he would leave open his door in the morning for his dad to come visit as a ghost. It was all of these things. But again, his, his neurosis is determined ultimately as military. These things are attached and invested socially. That was the point of this. This section is talking through, look, these things have actual social determinations. These aren't just out of nowhere. The fourth wolf man, Wolfman totally is all over like this 
uh, the servant girl, the poor servant girl who he could not get out of his head as like the sexual object. We're just going to move straight to her, uh, straight to him because it is, I think, easier um, to sort of talk through. Um, uh, but that's the, the Wolfman demonstrates a marked taste for the poor woman, the peasant girl in all fours washing clothes or a servant scrubbing the floor. These things that he was invested in, it's a very specific social investment that they're attached to, that they're sexually desiring. And that's the the point I think that is trying to be made here is the investments are not, um, you know, this weird desublimation that then becomes attached and sort of has these things it connects to, but instead there's a social field, uh, a singularity that is being directly loved or connected with by the libido, libido itself that is causing these elements that is actually um, sort of the underlying thing here. He's going through a handful of examples is, is how I read this, this paragraph at least as a handful of examples. But it's typical to losing lottery where before they give us this, their thoughts on this list, right? They're going to make the list and then the next paragraph explain it. <laughs> exactly. Just like they always do, right? <laughs> But I mean, to your point, like even with the peasant girl, right, there's, we can see the implications of codes as much as point signs there, right? You know, the, the peasantry as one, one set of code, but also like, right, we can read into this how there's something going on here with just the connections of what the person is doing, how the body is interacting with the floor and the actions it's taking, right? There's the functionalities going on there as much as there's the possibility of the codes. Yeah. And I'm not even sure, like when you talk about like Ratman, his investment in a torture specifically from the Orient, I, I think one, I'm not even sure that that's a real thing. Um, that like, Oh, it's uh, Chinese torture is rat ass eating, but instead that it is an investment in this sort of exotic otherly thing the the social field again, to go into, it's always military. It's always this sort of weird, um, connection of all of, again, these vibrations moving in and out. They talked about it, uh, the intersecting from one society to another, one group from another one clan to another, these flows that are moving. The idea of this form of torture for the rat man originating in the Orient, is it that he's attracted to the torture and the rat or the idea of the Orient and the thing he's constructed around it to go back and talk through as we were just doing with um, Gundiva? Like, it's not even necessarily real. It's the attachments that he's got in all of these ways to these sort of social historical investments that his libido has that makes these things and makes these neurotics uh, sort of uh, reactions to them, I think is more of a push that they're making here. I think, I think. It, it's, we're at that starting point, right? I mean, this is the trouble with lists is like, they're listing these things out and we kind of have to do the work with the connective tissue and that, you know, they're not going to give us their thoughts till they're really done with the list. Yeah. And they're about to start. I mean, we've got, I think, is it two or three more paragraphs where we really are getting through them? We, I think we could make it through another paragraph probably. Cause the only thing just to touch on a little bit more in this, in this paragraph is that, right. You can see a series of splittings happening. Yes. Yeah, I, I think that's a good way to put it. The, these examples that they're giving are, um, uh, we'll just start at the beginning. Um, for those looking for a thesis topic on psychoanalysis, one should not suggest vast considerations on analytic epistemology, but modest and rigorous topics, such as the theory of maids or domestic servants in Freud's thought. The, the thread through all of this is maids as a thing, um, uh, servant women who are poorer than you that work for you, that those run through all of these, that that is itself a thing worth looking at. There, there are indices in this area on the subject of maids who are present everywhere in cases studied by Freud. There occurs an exemplary hesitation in Freudian thought, a hesitation too quickly resolved in favor of what was to become a dogma of psychoanalysis. The critique, Philippe Girard, and all of this, and I'm sure this is what I'm hoping this is what you said while I was gone. Maybe you didn't. Um, Philippe Gerard's critique is that Freud 
like inserted his own pathologies essentially inside of all of this. It just happens that there's always this made thing happening, this higher or lower rank or this direct determination of class. So when Freud is analyzing someone, you can actually see, we're not talking about rat man. When I'm, when I'm making my comments, I'm not talking about rat man. We don't even know who the fuck rat man is. Rat man is an anonymous name that Freud gave in order to protect the guy's identity. We're talking about Freud's interpretation of it and where Freud found connection, where he found where he, his desire machines fucked, where his investments were. It just so happens, always, always, we find this weird higher or lower rank obsession with the sort of class standard or the woman on all knee, on all fours, the cleaning woman, the rich woman and poor woman that's inserted that I don't even know if there's actually anything in Ratman that makes sense directly. I would really have to go back and reread it. But uh, like Ratman's, direct testimony i don't think has anything to do with it i do think that's a freud addition so again like with Gradiva, where this guy is obsessed and finding any reason to sort of go you're the woman from the bass relief oh my god here's freud in all of these going oh my god what you really want is this made thing and i totally am not the one who has an investment in this overall social strata of classes it's so totally not me which is what it is it's it's him doing it and the joke being that uh, it's a it's too quickly resolved in flavor in favor of what was to become a dogma of psychoanalysis, and that's the next paragraph which I'm going to dive to. Um, the fundamental problem with regard to these texts is the following: Must we see in all these sexual social investments of the libido and these object choices mere dependencies of a familial Oedipus? Must we save Oedipus at all costs by interpreting these investments and object choices as defenses against incest? Thus the familial romance or Oedipus's own wish to have born of poor parents who would cleanse him of his crime. Must these be understood as compromises and substitutes for incest? Thus in the wolfman, the peasant girl as a substitute for his sister having the same name as her or the girl on hands and knees working as a substitute for the mother surprised in coitus. Or the rat man, the disguised repetition of the paternal situation, making it possible to enrich or impregnate Oedipus with a fourth symbolic term, charged with accounting for the splittings through which the libido invests the social field. Freud makes a firm choice in this last direction, all the more firm that, according to his own confession, he wants to set things straight with Jung and Adler. And having ascertained in the Wolfman case, the existence of an intention of debasing the woman as love object, he concludes that it is merely a matter of a rationalization and that the true underlying determination almost always leads us back to the sister, the mommy, considered as the only purely erotic mood motives. Taking up the eternal refrain of Oedipus, the eternal lullaby, he writes, A child pays no regard to social distinctions, which have little meaning for it as yet, and it classes people of inferior rank with its parents if they love it as its parents do. Um, that, I think, is a better version of what I was saying, actually. <laughs> That's a much better way of phrasing what I was saying in the previous. That um, ultimately, Freud himself writes, a child pays no regard to social distinctions which have little meaning for it as yet, and it classes people of inferior rank with its parents if they love it as its parents do. I actually want to go straight through the next one. Is anything worth in that one going over in that paragraph? Uh, the only question I had uh, lingering was, uh, I kind of get the reference to Jung and Adler, but I was wondering if there was anything particular that I should know. Um, hmm. I'm not certain there either. It could be on a matter of taking Oedipus to the symbolic. So that like as opposed to like general archetypes, right? They would just be Oedipus. That's possible, but I'm not sure that's what they're saying either. We'd yeah. have to do some digging. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, but uh, I figured I would ask just in case there was something known. I don't think it's necessarily... Um, if I had to guess, they just mean quite literally like Freud set out, because he talked about it, that these people were, were fairly contemporaries of a lot of this stuff. And so his desire to sort of set his version of it or his 
his style of these things. You know, the psychoanalytic school versus the Adlerian school, as an example, um, they they treated things uh, differently. But like he and Adler were like, I think they worked together for a long time even. Um, I think he was, you know, instrumental in psychoanalytic theory. So I think a lot of it was, oh, Adler went this direction, I need to set things straight. Jung went this direction, you just set, he's in that specific place. He is going out of his way um, to, uh, as they say, after having ascertained in the Wolfman case the existence of an intention of debasing the woman as love object, he concludes it is a matter of rationalization and that the true underlying determination almost always leads us back to sister, to the mommy, considered as the only purely erotic motives. Um, he's very much stating clearly here that no, Adler, it's not this sort of... Um, I mean, it's tough to just classify Adler as like more towards like an individual behaviorist kind of mentality. Adler is very complex. I don't want to uh, go into it too heavily. I'm not nearly educated enough. But specifically here, um, in the Wolfman case, he goes, oh, the intention to debase the woman as love object by the Wolfman is actually just a rationalization. That is a thing in his head he's doing and that the actual underlying determination always leads us back underneath it. What he really wants always leads us back to sister mommy. Those are the only purely erotic motives. He very cleanly is saying the only thing we ever are sexually attracted to is mommy. And it's always leads us back there. And that's the, that's their underlying again, critique of all of this, <laughs> that things lead back, but it's, they're being very clear. He's stating that is what Oedipus always leads us back to. He did, which is fair. He did. He did say that and and have that conversation. A child pays no regard to social distinctions. That none of that matters. The social distinctions don't matter to a child. I'm not saying D and G believe this. I'm saying I'm quoting the the Freud line here. Um, the children don't care about class or rich or poor. Those things don't matter at all. Um, a child classes people inferior with its parents. If they love it as its parents do, if they how they feel about the class, they follow their parental determinations and the 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 desires there. So again, going back to Oedipalization of sort of those desires and elements. Why do I prefer what phrasing? Oh, I think I think Ash means like you said, this paragraph um phrases better what you were trying to express in the previous. Yeah, that we're we're not here talking about it, again, we're not talking about Wolfman. We're not here talking about the four. We're talking about, we're almost actually schizoanalyzing Freud through his investments in the social field and where his sex is found. We are finding his indices in his analysis of other people, I think is the, the point that they're making. Uh, and, and what this paragraph and, and the previous are ultimately about, and the next also as well that we're able to find these indices and these investments, I think, uh, through these. Um, I, I kind of want to go right to the next because it, it does continue this. I just want some uh, clarification on this. The, Please. Are, are, they, are they saying that it is Freud who is making these, um, uh, these kind of, um, you know, statements that uh, about the, these four examples are, are examples of um, uh, substitute, uh, substitute and compromises for for incest. I'm gonna. I've got a joke. That's one of my favorite psycho psychology jokes. A uh, guy goes to his therapist, and the therapist goes, "Okay, we're gonna do Rorschach chess." He goes, "Okay." He holds up a picture. The guy goes, "Oh, that's a that's a dick." It's like, "Oh." He holds up another picture. He goes, "Oh, that's a vagina." Oh, and he goes, uh, holds up another one. Oh, it's two people having sex. And he goes. I know what's wrong with you. Jesus Christ, you've got, you've, you've got sex on the mind. The patient looks at him and goes, you're the one drawing the dirty pictures. That is kind of what I think they're saying here, that Freud is the one saying, like Freud's the one drawing the dirty pictures, kind of, that because he actually is. He's giving us these stories, and his filter that we're getting them through, his investments are actually coming through fairly crisp in this. Um. And so when we talk about what his investments were in class, again, Freud specifically, if you want to talk about his contingent existence, um, 
it's worth going back and reading his history of being born in this hyper bourgeois, uh, you know, semi upper class family with servants, with maids specifically. Uh, there's some stories there. He's got a bunch of shit going on and how he carries these things forward. It's not so much about saying, Oh, he, he, he had maids when he was younger. So he's got maids now. No, it's, it's how he was invested socially in all of these different elements through all of this. Again, if we want to find the indices, find out where the desire is sitting. And that's what they're, we're doing now talking about Freud and this previous, this paragraph I just read says that a lot cleanly, more cleanly than I do. I think, um, the, the phrasing, uh, that they open the paragraph with, um, these fundamental problems with regard to these tests is the following. We must see in all these sexual social investments of the libido and these object choices, mere dependencies of a familial Oedipus. Must we save Oedipus at all costs by interpreting these investments and object choices as defenses against incest? Must these be understood as compromises and substitutes for incest? Freud makes a firm choice of this last direction. The answer is yes, by the way. Um, that's the basically the rest of it is this I'm going, yeah, no, for, according to Freud, these must be understood as compromises and substitutes for incest. The Wolfman rationalizes his desire to debase the woman because ultimately it's about his mom. Um, so I'm going to read the next paragraph now. Oh, very quick before Sorry, you go ahead. Oh, no problem. Yeah, the one thing I wanted to say there is that as I'm reading it, on one hand, there's the, the Freud bringing in the Oedipus side of things. There's also Freud bringing in the maid side. Um, and I, I think this is how they're trying to do this, is like that aspect of the, re the repressing representation, right? This is where they're trying, this is where they're locating it, right, in Freud's reading of this. At the same time, they're seeing in Freud's reading uh, this point about the maid. And I think that interaction is part of how we're seeing a lot of this repression taking place too. Because I I think what they're saying is that you do have the splitting and that happening, and this does relate to indices at one and the same time. This repressing, you know, Oedipus is coming in as a rep form of repression upon that, right? I think that's how they're trying to lay it out. I have well, to. I no, it, like I'll continue that. Really I'll, it, I'll continue that because it, it's the the mark that's happening here is Freud is saying no, it is about the mom because kids don't give a shit about class. Like, uh, let me just put on my Freud mask for a moment. Hello, uh, kids don't care about class or poverty or who's lumpen proletariat or bourgeoisie. They don't even know those words. They know the word mommy, and you know if the parents treat the poor as shit, they probably also treat the poor as shit. Or if they see dad fucking the maid, they totally want the maid. Like it's their relationship with all that. It's always through mommy, daddy, and really is about their relationship with mommy, daddy. That's kind of how Freud ran with it and went very hard with it. A child doesn't care. They love these things as their parents do. And ultimately all of it is a, sub a substitute for uh, incest. But maybe, maybe, hmm, taking Freud mask off. Now, uh, maybe it's actually not those things, but maybe that's what Freud called them and names them. And maybe actually these things flow through the parents. Maybe he was actually close, but not quite there. Maybe he just didn't quite go far enough. Because, to continue, we always fall back into the false alternative where Freud was led by Oedipus and then confirmed in this position by his controversy with Adler and Jung. Either, he says, you will abandon the sexual position of the libido in favor of an individual and social will to power, or in favor of a prehistoric collective conscience, or you will recognize Oedipus, making of it the sexual abode of the libido, and you will make daddy mommy into the purely erotic motive. Oedipus, the touchstone of the pure psychoanalyst on which to sharpen the sacred blade of successful castration. Yet, what was the other direction? Glimpsed for a moment by Freud, apropos of the familial romance, before the Oedipal trapdoor slammed shut. It is the direction rediscovered, at least hypothetically, by Philippe Girard. There is no family where vacuoles are not arranged, 
and where extra familial breaks are not manifest by means of which the libido is engulfed in order to sexually invest the non-familial, i.e. the other class, as determined under the empirical rubrics of the richest and the poorest, and sometimes both at once. Wouldn't the great other, indispensable to the position of desire, be the social other? Social difference, apprehended and invested as the non-family within the family itself? The other class is by no means grasped by the libido as a magnified or impoverished image of the mother, but as the foreign, the non-mother, the non-father, the non-family, the index of what is non-human in sex, and without which the libido would not assemble its desiring machines. Class struggle goes to the heart of the ordeal of desire. The familial romance is not a derivative of Oedipus. Oedipus is a drift of the familial romance and thereby of the social field. It is not a question of denying the importance of parental coitus and the position of the mother, but when the position makes the mother resemble a floor washer or an animal, what authorizes Freud to say that the animal or the maid stand for the mother, independently of the social or generic differences, instead of concluding that the mother also functions as something other than the mother? and gives rise in the child's libido to an entire differentiated social investment at the same time as she opens the way to a relationship with the non-human sex. For whether the mother works or not, whether the mother is from a richer or poorer background than the father, etc., has to do with breaks and flows that traverse the family, but that overreach it on all sides and are not familial. And this is their critique. Finally, um, we get around to it. Um, they've been outlining Freud and where he's been sitting and how he talks about these things and how Oedipus plays and very clearly here saying, no, 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 this is not an alternative where either Freud says, yes, no, it's the, the drives within or, or within that. There's no two options. It's not Edler and Jung on one side and, and Freud on the other. And he only had those two options. He could have, there was a third option. There was another direction that we saw for a moment. And it's in that last line they use in the previous paragraph. Um, it classes people of inferior rank with its parents if they love it as parents do. You can see a, a glimpse of it there. You can see what, oh, they're, oh, right there. They start screaming almost. This is what we're talking about. In this moment, the, the relations that are flowing through the parents to the child around the family that extend beyond it on all sides, the entire social relation that, yes, the parents may be a filter for, but they are not the object of. This is it. It is the direction, as they say, rediscovered by Philip Girard in the previous uh, paragraph we read. There is no family where vacuoles are not arranged, where extra familiar breaks are not manifest by means of which libido is engulfed in order to sexually invest the non-familial, the other class, the richest and poorest, and sometimes both at once. Every family is part of this. Every family is manufacturing. Every family is ultimately its own machine doing its own things within these flows and within these breaks and within these connections. I leave it open for a moment. I, I want to make sure I stop because we this is a complex one, but I do love I do love the phrasing around this a lot. All right, I can continue. Wouldn't the great other, indispensable to the position of desire, be the social other? Social difference apprehended in investment as the non family within the family itself? Fucking good line. Tough one though. Tough one, because we're talking about the great other, and I think you could say um, there's a little Lacan in here. Um, the idea of the great other that is watching, that's keeping an eye, um, more Freud a little bit, but wouldn't ultimately we be talking about the social order, social difference that is apprehended and invested as the non-family within the family itself? The You do not simply have, if you take any coordinates, it doesn't matter who you are, anyone. Look at your parents. You do not only have mommy and daddy. You have those people, but those are simple, light meanings of what it means to have mommy, daddy. There's a lot more happening in any family from the social realities of having conservative parents, the social realities of having 
anything else in the space. Hey, do we have dinner tonight? Oh yes. No, we're going to the Bahamas. We're on a cruise with Buffy and we're going to the Marina. We're going to the rings. We're going to sports. We, I'm going to work 10 hours a day. All of these things are the non-family within the family. This is, this is the point that they're making that it's not just the family. It's not that the family doesn't exist. It's a fucking thing. You have parents. They say cleanly like, Hey, by the way, we're not saying the parents coitus doesn't matter. Or like seeing your parents fucking isn't some odd thing or, you know, that the, the mother isn't involved in different stuff. Like this is, of course they are. Everyone's very you know, multiplicity. They can be a lot of things, but the family isn't just the family. It's not just mommy, daddy, me, and we reduce it. Those are elements and intensities within the flows that are outflowing on every side, coming in and out and, and crisscrossing. The same way, if you were to take any group, you could say uh, America. Let's take America. Well, let's take uh, Oregon. Uh, I, live, I live there. Actually, let's take Portland. Actually, let's take my square block. Actually, let's take my, na my uh, house. Actually, let's take me. Just feel free to sort of zoom in and out however you want. None of these are just it. There aren't flows that are cut off. It's not an island. Things crisscross, move in and out all the time. They still are singularities. They still are elements. They're still organisms inside of it. I'm not saying my, my wife doesn't exist. My parents don't exist in some capacity. It's, it's that they aren't just mom and everything doesn't reduce to that. It's that these things are almost uh, emergent from these elements. They are part of it and that flows come through them. And this is uh, ultimately how a child learns to invest and learns to be repressed as well, uh, as we'll see. The familial romance is not a derivative of Oedipus. Oedipus is a drift of the familial romance and thereby of the social field. It's a great, great line. Uh, and it's, this is their critique of Oedipus, that Oedipus isn't foundational. Your mom isn't foundational. Your dad, your relationship with them is not hyper-determinant or specified, and we need to get to whatever, some sort of weirdly idealized version of it, um, or that everything is ultimately emergent from that. Oh, he, he was aroused by the woman on all fours because he once saw his mom getting done doggy style, and that's it. He just wanted her let's go back to it it's like uh there's probably a lot more to that than that um it, it doesn't matter as they end uh whether the mother works or not whether the mother is from rich or poor background than the father has to do with breaks and flows that traverse the family but that overreach on all sides and are not familial it is not that the mother being poor is the thing whether or not she works whether or not she's rich or poor is because of social flows. It's not like the mother exists free of society. It's not like your dad does. It's not like your aunt and uncle do. It's not like your brother does. It's not like you do. We all are determined within society. And so because of that, anything familial exists, but it is not the foundational thing that Oedipus demands. I hope that makes sense. That's kind of the big point of this paragraph and the last few, actually, I think. I get a little impassioned about this one. I, uh, this is like, actually, I actually get impassioned a lot about, I love reading this shit so much. Please, someone talk, words, speak, type. What do you think, Drew? <laughs> I seriously was just going to say um, this made a lot of sense to me it, it fit and um, the only thing that I because I'm from sociology the, the deal with sociology is that there's, they're constantly subdividing um, person, community city, state and there was at least at some point um the real like the recognition that there is no clear distinction between this is the micro level you plus another person interacting and this is the national level of this is how a country works it's every interconnection or collection of uh potential 
network connections from me thinking about myself five minutes ago to the entirety of all human existence. Like, mm -hmm. so that's me going off on how how interconnected this is and how that was the message this whole for the whole book. Yes, uh, and that reading, hearing you read it because you read it, and having read it earlier, it made. It just made so much sense to me, and I have no basis in Freud, so this is where I'm coming from with that. Well, that's fine. It's it's a, a, I think it's the kind of thing that a lot of their wording, um, if you go back specifically uh, to A Hole in Its Parts, uh, which is my favorite, uh, I need to stop saying that. It's such a good uh, section of this book where they describe at length and go through the process of how to think of a th of, of everything that everything is a whole and its parts. And that ultimately, you know, when we talk about um, a nation, like, sure, these are representations. They're, they're things to discuss and they're, um, they're good for us to understand uh, aggregates, uh, the laws of large numbers, as you might say, for us to grasp kind of a large scale reality, but they're still emergent. And, and ultimately I think that's where they're coming from that family and what it does to us is emergent. Now there are still realities of it because, you know, I'm born into a family, but I'm, my family existed before I was born. My parents were born into families that existed before they were born. And we were all part of a neighborhood or a nation or a state or a people before that. Like these things existed before we were born and were communicated by a representation of them in the same way that, um, you know, the, they use the example of the Phoenician and the Akkadian, um, the Phoenician, uh, has the sound ah for water. And so they have the the sort of chicken scratch symbol of an A, but they don't think of it as water. They think of it as that sound and they associate the sound with water. And Akkadian comes along, who's illiterate, and points to the sign and goes, what's that? And the Phoenician goes, oh, that that's water. Now that symbol means water. It is water. It is not a representation. It is not like a second step. And just like that, we aren't in a family. Well, we're born into it the family isn't really what came first. That's, that's the chicken and the egg question, which by the way, the answer is the egg because it's, it's what makes the chicken. Um, but they're also a whole in its parts. It's, it's understanding the chain of these events, the way that they're connected, the way that the processes of time manufacture them. And so when the family exists, sure, we want to say, look, a child's raised by two people, but we're divorcing them from everything else that's happening. And we're divorcing them from their realities. And we're also divorcing them from their social positions. And as soon as we start doing that, we start specifying and, and cutting off and separating. And we lose the whole from the whole in its parts. And it gets really, it's, it gets dangerous to be frank. But yes, I'm glad you, I'm glad it helps, Drew. Yeah, definitely. I, I also, well, I'm, failing to also read a uh, a thousand plateaus so but um the reference to the wolfman also fits in pretty nicely uh, i think in both texts with this this larger um discussion of you know moving past simple aggregates um following how they fit in right because I, I think a large bit of this is like the the point is not to take the maid as the mother wholesale, right? Like what Freud's kind of seeing here in terms of like the um at least as I'm reading this, like with the maids and, and with the flow of wealth, right? Which helps constitute a maid. That's part of the delirium of it, right? That's part of this index of love is those things are there. And the what what basically what Oedipus does, right, is it, um, you know, it, it kind of helps repress a lot of the stuff, and it also like part of what they're saying too is right, it kind of moves the, uh, moves the goalpost in a manner of speaking too. But to your point, right, like, I mean, the molecular, you're right, the molecular doesn't know those things either, just like the id doesn't think about objects when it desires. Yep. Just, just trying to make sure we keep that in mind is like, you know, that those things are there. It's just, you know, it fit into that index of love. And they don't, 
Right. The interest doesn't necessarily speak for the desire. It's, it's exactly, it's, it's once we concretize and we call her mom or we call him dad and we take all of the things that they are or desire or have as part of them. And we basically have them wear it as medals where it's like, this is their thing. And that's dad over there divorced from anything that's happening in the rest of his life. It's shitty job, awful boss, uh, great job, wonderful boss, whatever it may be. Um, uh, mistresses, uh, drinking binges, uh, sports teams, all the things that like, I'm sorry, I'm from the Midwest, you're going to like that sports is huge, but like, it's a huge part of like families in the Midwest. Like let's take out all the social considerations and turn them into a thing. And it's like, no, no, no. The, the thing that is there is the overlapping of all of these layers of intensities that are sort of driving through this organism. And they are emergent of that. And mom too, by the way, but also child too, sort of through parents who are lenses, because that's who we deal with. But as our social sort of network grows and the connections we have grows, the flows grow and the number of flows and the, the same way that, um, you know, my son doesn't, he's got, uh, when you, well, let's talk about my daughter, my daughter's super young. She has no friends. She doesn't, she doesn't even cognize words yet fully. Uh, she hasn't kind of grasped her name. She's only three and a half months old. Um, she is wholly socialized and dealing with flows through my wife and I. Um, that's, that's it. Also her brother to a point. Uh, but he's also mostly through us. But he's been going to soccer. He's got friends in the neighborhood. He's seeing people. He's having conversations. The amount of flows that he's dealing with is increasing. Over time, it gets more and more. But for now, everything my wife and I do is ultimately the redirection or the lens of those flows to him. He's His entire world is two nodal connections, basically, to society. And everything flows through us. So it's not that we aren't dealing with our parents. It's not that he magically is somehow dealing with larger society outside of us. We are the lens for that. But it is still the society at large that is determining those connections. And as he gets older, when he goes to elementary school and then junior high, when he has a girlfriend and a second family and, uh, you know, falls in love, goes to college, falls out of love, all of these other things create that larger tapestry that he is seen and socialized by. It gets massively complicated, but the early ones are very much my wife and I, or in previous times, uh, larger families, aunts, uncles, grandparents. Uh, big sisters, big brothers. We all have different ways that we're ultimately socialized. So they are the lens, but that lens disappears and gets larger. But we still see things in some way through those same investments. Like there is, there is a general investment that we are able to carry through. And that's a lot of what they talk about here. And the critique of Freud is that he, instead of allowing them to be this general play of investments of non-human sexes as things are connecting. He demands that we name them. We call them mommy. We call them daddy. And everything is about wanting to fuck or kill. And that triangulation ruins our ability to have any sort of, um, sort of non-normative uh, relationship with anything or even new ideas or thoughts or concepts because everything ultimately being forced to come back to mommy, daddy, me, means it has to be literally pointed towards those social relations instead of understanding that they were part of some much larger thing that was emergent. Tough being a parent. I'll tell you that it fucking sucks. It's like the best thing ever, but God, it's like weird. Yeah, I definitely can't imagine. But I mean, going back to that, right, this is part of the thing, too, that we want to keep in mind is like, it it's separating out the representation from what's happening. And I think this does come up a little bit in, in civilizations, discontents, like, and in some ways, losing water, explaining it better without just kind of implying a contradiction, right? Um, or that at least they're, they're developing that idea. Um, I think further, right? Like at some level in social production, right? The wolf man or the rat man, this this stuff is happening, right? It's to say that it's just to say that like this made thing 
is not necessarily a question of the mother. If anything, the mother can be a question of the maid, right? Mm -hmm. And this is kind of, and this is at that molar level, right? At the molecular level, it's it's a little bit of a different question because we're always kind of navigating the two. You know, we can kind of rely on that point of like, yeah, when we're talking about the whole object, right, we're probably talking about social production, right? Um, this is where you can kind of see where like social production is at play here and what the wolfman's going through or the, the rat man or what, even Freud for that matter. This is to say at one and the same time though, right? There's still that point at which Oedipus comes in and affects social production as much as desiring production as I'm reading it. Because that's kind of like, I think what Gerard's putting his finger on here too is right. There is social production and desiring production. There is this index of love hap or indices of even perhaps happening here at one and the same time how does oedipus fit in but it seems that oedipus um, affects those indexes indices excuse me uh, without necessarily being what constitutes them right and this is kind of the type this is i think like in some ways this is kind of the brilliance of what they're talking about but it can also be the challenge is like these three things are happening and you know it's that point of trying to find our way through the delirium as much as the um as much as the love here. Right. And and vis a vis the representations, right? Where something like Oedipus comes in and you know you have these aggregations like something like the maid, for instance. Um, and you have the mother bearing down upon that without necessarily being what produces it. Um, I think with that, I'm actually going to say that we're going to drop uh, here today because um, I think we have, I mean, we're over time and I don't, I think we start the next one. That's going to be long enough. The underlying thing today was getting through finally everything that's stacked up, everything we've talked through and getting through from the po second positive task about understanding what investment means and what is invested very directly taking aim at Oedipus and Oedipus as through Freud, that it is not determinate, it is not aimed, that these things sort of exist in some capacity, but that even in Freud, we can see these things as indices for himself, because this is how these things bleed through the, the non-human sex um, of, of all of it. I, I adore this, uh, this phrasing. We're about to get into, um, I think, a much more complex um, element about how the libido to what uh, Jack was just talking through um, actually deals with parents and a lot of what my sort of ramble was about when we talk about the, the family and what it actually means and how we're actually sort of you know, what we learn, what we're invested in by parents, things like that. We're going to be getting into that uh, next week. So for now, I'm going to leave it. Um, I thank all of you for joining us. This is, as I always say, this is the highlight of my week. I adore it very much. Um, uh, don't hesitate to ask questions in the anti Oedipus chat or anywhere else uh, if you have them. I'm going to be trying to hold later this week a sort of impromptu hour, two hours of just like talking anti Oedipus uh, because I enjoyed doing that a few weeks ago and I think it, it could be really positive. It's just more of an open, like after people have a chance to digest or, you know, not recorded, no pressure for us to get moving uh, things. So I'm going to start doing more of those. But um, thank all of you for joining. And I look forward to next week. Yeah, it's been fun, man. Very good.